Hey, welcome back to the Dave Kittle Show. I am Dave Kittle, owner of Concierge Pain Relief, home physical therapy in the New York City area and the CEO of the Fieldmaker Group. Currently speaking with practice owners about partnering or acquiring some or all of their practice in the New York and New Jersey area. And today we have our colleague, Sturdy McKee, back on the show. He is a physical therapist, previous practice owner, author, podcaster, business coach, uh, many other things. And uh, he's helped me immensely with uh, with what we're doing at Fieldmaker Group and as business coach and colleague. Today, we're going to be talking about recruiting, hiring. Uh, we're going to be talking about something that Sturdy is now working on called PT Match. And we're going to talk about what we're seeing in regards to not just my challenge and other owners that we know in our circle, other practice owners having challenges and other business owners having challenges with recruiting and hiring and finding and identifying key talent and top talent. And we're going to get into all that right now. So Sturdy, welcome back on the show. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So I wanted to get you on here. I think maybe you said I was going to be one of your earlier clients or customers for this new PT match thing. Um, before we get into that, what are you seeing in, in this world of um, recruiting and hiring? Is that part of why you're you're working on this new product and this new service and solution? Um, just a little bit of an intro in terms of like what you're seeing and, and why PT Match. Yeah, so it was a couple things came together, right? This is the recruiting and finding great candidates is like turned into one of the number one pain points for the majority of my clients. And then as I was talking to other people, like, you know, I do webinars and I do other stuff, educational stuff and bring people in. And we were, I did a compensation analysis, like what could you afford to pay your PTs? And um, I had more signups, even at a hundred dollar price point than I've had for a lot of stuff I've done in the past. And everybody's, well, not everybody, that's an exaggeration, 90%, because there's always one that isn't having a problem, right? But uh, everybody else is having a problem getting candidates and finding candidates. And this is this you know, pain point. Well, part of what kind of came together with that is on a bigger picture scale, and it, you know, I can show the handouts and things that we're giving out to employers and the candidates and what have you, but there's a survey that Gallup does every year, you know, Gallup polling, they do, but they do a bunch of different surveys. They don't just do you know, TV or political or whatever, they do a bunch of stuff. And they've been doing this employee engagement survey since 1987. And the number that's so striking is that 70% of American employees are disengaged at work. And disengaged, meaning they're lacking clarity, they're lacking motivation, they're not giving it their all, they're not feeling connected to their work, what have you. They have these 12 questions or criteria that they go through or uh, categories and then they break it down. And each year they give advice on what to do, like this is the out the thing that scans out and what have you. And I didn't realize the survey was that old. I just, you know, saw this survey for a couple of years running and it hasn't really changed. You know, ironically during COVID, it was down to 64%, but that's the best it's ever been. And it's been as high as 72%. But basically since 1987, for over 35 years, it's been hovering around 70% and it hasn't changed. And I'm looking at those numbers and I'm looking at what they, you know, are recommending. Like the 2023 survey came out in February. 70% of American employees are disengaged at work, 18 or 19% are actively disengaged, which doesn't mean they're not rowing the boat. It means they're drilling holes in the boat, right? Or knocking other people out of, you know, out of the boat or whatever, which is kind of crazy to me. But the, the other thing, Dave, is the numbers are worse globally. Like 80% of global employees are disengaged at work. And I'm sitting there thinking about this and how the needle hasn't moved. And the number one re recommendation they made this year in February was clarity. You know, people are lacking clarity. They're lacking clarity around why they're doing what they're doing, what the meaningful work is, what their top priorities are, and all that stuff. Well, dude, I wrote I wrote that book, right? Like literally, you know this, but I'm not sure. It's literally titled "Nobody's a Mind Reader: The Power of Clarity for Business Leaders and Entrepreneurs." It emphasizes that. I don't disagree with that, but I'm sitting here going, "Wait a minute! If that's the case, why?" Why aren't the tools that Gallup's been putting out there and business experts been putting out there for 35 years, why aren't they moving the needle? And it's not that they're bad tools, right? But what kind of dawned on me with all of this, this disengagement piece, these tools thing, the challenges people are having, the ch you know, I, I hired people for 20 plus years, employed people, did the interview of hiring processes, wrote a course on interviewing and hiring process, 
all that stuff. And I was sitting here kind of going, well, if you're not in the right relationship to begin with, then all the tools in the world aren't going to fix it. And I think we're thinking about work, you know, historically, and, and maybe this is part of the COVID kind of reset and that there's a generational reset too, but I think traditionally, depending on the generation and time period, whatever, we think of work as this transactional thing. We paid for our time, paid for, you know, some exchange of value or whatever, and, you know, socket to the man and their exploitative capitalism and, you know, on and on and on, right? And I'm sitting here kind of going, well, wait a minute, you're spending over, over a third of your waking hours at work, right? It's north of 35% of your waking hours are spent at work. I'm like, I know I've been in a situation. I mean, I, I had an epiphany when I in the company I own when I got up one morning on a Monday morning and I thought I didn't want to go to work. And it really hit me because I'm sitting there going, oh, okay, wait a minute. If I feel that way, what in the world does my team feel? Right? That's not the culture I want. Something's wrong. I need to do something about that. So we worked very actively to change that. And we ended up building a great team. It was painful. The growing pains were hard. But we built a great team that was just a joy to be around, a joy to work with. You know, it's not saying it's like any relationship, right? It's not without issues. It's not without, you know, conflict or or whatever. But on a day to day basis, on an ongoing basis, it's just so much more positive. And that kind of proved that, hey, this is possible. And then I've been doing that with clients for the past seven plus years, you know, and same thing. It's painful going through the initial transition. But down the road, like, I just can't believe how much different this is, how everybody's happy, they're engaged, they're, you know, they're loving what they do. And a lot of that has to do with that selection. And I, and I feel like, and, I, and I've witnessed and watched that a lot of recruiters, and not just like people out there doing recruiting on the, you know, as an outsourced thing, but in-house HR departments, all the rest of it, that they, again, are treating it transactionally. They're treating it as something that they need to get done and get the deal done, get it closed versus picking the right people who are going to succeed over the long term and really love what they do, connect with what they do, care about the people they're working with and all those things. So, you know, we built a framework based upon all that experience on uh, if anybody's familiar with top grading, Brad Smart wrote a book and created a process that's really Good. It's really robust, but it's kind of involved. So, you know, they really developed that around GE and some big, big companies. And those big companies, you know, we don't have those resources. So there's an adaptations that we can make to make it work, make it happen. And then finally, I was like, you know, why don't I, why don't I get into this and do this for people? So it's more of a done for you, done with you kind of thing, as opposed to teach you how to do it. Cause I've been, you know, I've been doing that for quite a while. PTs do that with their patients all the time. We know how hard and challenging that can be sometimes. Right. And uh, yeah. Why not take it off their plate and help them out. And why, like, I mean, it makes sense a little bit more of a higher touch. You, you have all this expertise and experience and a little bit now uh, the idea of like more of a higher touch, maybe a white glove service of, matchmaking or almost maybe it's more similar to executive headhunting as opposed to the traditional recruiting model where like you said it's very like spray and spray it's like volume based it's transactional based so is is matchmaking if there's like the traditional recruiting just volume play that's one pillar or that's like one bucket another bucket is like executive headhunting which is really more for like the c-suite and corporate executives is what you're doing with matchmaking and, and PC matches that's similar to the executive headhunting, or is that like a third bucket that's kind of like a different approach and, and unique to the other two? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I think it's going to be more similar to the executive headhunting because they're going deeper and trying to find synergies, find aligned values, find aligned priorities. Um, really, it's super important that when you bring in a leader you know, in a company that they align with the culture um, or they align with the culture that you want, right? They're going to make a shift, but that's intentional. What you don't want to do in that situation is bring in somebody who is, has, is disconnected or, you know, or in opposition to the current culture, if that's a healthy culture, right? So there's that. But what, you know, one of the things we're looking at 
is we've created a process, you know, and it's it's a it's a process system, but it's operated by people largely at this point. Ultimately, I want to automate more of that process. I want to do more algorithm, more more matchmaking on that front. Mm-hmm. Um, think eHarmony instead of Tinder, right? It's not just you know, do they look good? But it's like, let's go through some of these other deeper things, prioritize those, find potential fit. So we want to kind of do a little, want to do that higher touch piece, but at scale. And right now, you know, it's very much more of an agency boutique kind of thing where I'm doing the vast majority of the work right now. But that's not the long term plan. We want to build something out that helps you know, find those right fits based on the right criteria, the stuff that we've been, you know, using and doing for over 20 years that has worked. But yeah, I mean, there, there's, at scale, that's got to be automated, systematized. It's got to, you got to create some structure around it with kind of a hybrid model of, yeah, we're still going to talk to the candidates, right? We're still going to talk with the employers and get a, you know, fill in the gaps and find out more. But um yeah, it's it is much more of matchmaking, and that's that brings up a whole nother point. I've talked to recruiters that call themselves matchmakers, and then I've started asking more questions, right? And you know, so what what do you base that on? And it what it, it devolves back into the basic things that most candidates are looking for. You know, location is it convenient? Is it where I want to live? Are they paying me enough? Uh, you know, kind of were they nice to me? Is it the right setting? And, and were they nice during the interview? And that's essentially the candidate's entire process right now. And then people go into, you know, and we've done it as employers, you know, you make a bad, a bad hire. A bad hire doesn't necessarily mean they can't do the job, right? It doesn't, I've had bad hires who were great therapists, you know, really skilled, really good patients may have loved them, but they were not a fit with what we were about, what we were, what we were trying to do. You know, they were a, a, a problem. They created conflict. They created you know, turmoil and things in, internally and kind of not playing by the rules. And that's really where the core values and that kind of stuff come in. If you're using them properly, they set the behavioral tone, the rules for decision-making, for engagement, for behaviors, all that stuff. So when we find that alignment, people can be happy at work, right? And engaged at work and get the things. Um, so one of the things we're doing was kind of, not kind of, we're really working on providing a process on the candidate side as well, because the employer can do do all this screening and all the questions and have a, you know, really robust and thorough process and still get it, you know, change the, the numbers, by the way, the numbers, if you're hiring kind of traditionally or basic or new to it and going on your gut and did you like them and did they have a nice resume, you get it right about 25% of the time, meaning you have an A player who's aligned with your values, who exceeds expectations, who does a great job, you've got one in four success, right? With the process and the systems on the employer side, if you do it properly, you can get that to 75, 80%, okay? Now, part of the reason it's 75, 80% is because candidates who really, really want the job or just want to close it or kind of dealing with it, you know, the old mindset of transactional or whatever, it, they know how to answer questions. They know how to smile. They know how to give you the right answer. And then when they get into the job, they might not love it as much. You might find there's not fit down the road, right? So I'm trying to kind of work on the other side of that and say, why would you try it? If you're the candidate and you determine that this wasn't a great fit for you, why would you try to close the deal, right? Why wouldn't you say, hey, you know what? It doesn't look like we're on the same page. But what I've kind of seen is that the vast majority of candidates don't really have a way to do that. They don't know how to assess that. And they don't have a process for doing it. And, and it's kind of obvious. Why would they for something they're going to do every two, five, seven years? You know, once they have to relearn that, come up with it. So if we can provide them that side of things as well, um, you know, a way to really methodically go about and determine whether this seems like a good fit to validate and verify that it perhaps is, you know, to go a bit deeper, spend a little bit more time on it to figure out, you know, hey, I'm going to be spending more than a third of my waking hours here for the next two years, five years, seven, eight, if I'm lucky, maybe this, you know, would be worthwhile spending another hour or two hours or three hours kind of sorting that and figuring it out. I was telling a buddy about this the other day, and he's like, yeah, you know, it's ironic. We spend more time picking out a mattress or shopping for a car than we do our next job. 
you know, and yeah, that's crazy. I mean, yeah, we want, we like our cars and all that stuff, right? We're going to sleep on our mattresses. But you're talking about, again, more than a third of your waking hours with these people. And we don't have a great process to vet, you know, from the other side. And I mean, what better time to, it's, it's, there are plenty of jobs for, particularly for physical therapists out there, right? So finding candidates is the big challenge. Candidates finding job openings is not a big challenge, but finding the right one still hasn't quite been sorted, right? So you're helping practice owners. It's almost like you're, you're nurturing both sides. So like I, absolutely. so, so I joined uh, PT match full disclosure. You were one of our first I, I, first 10 customers. It's still brand new. So yes, yes. So I'm an early adopter. Excellent. Uh pay, paying customer. Uh and you're you're helping. So I also, you know, you help me through paid business coaching as well, where I kind of have learned a little bit better interviewing process, getting organized well, and played. You've done a great, you've done a great job of getting better at that process and implementing the process and even your own skill set around the interviews and stuff too. So you just have a ton of credit for that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, but now it's like, I've, I've been giving you the feedback of like, you know, using LinkedIn ads, Indeed ads, and you know, it's it's certainly been better than nothing at all. Uh, but it's, it's intermittent. And um, when you mentioned this offering and you kind of went through it for PT Match, it was just like, oh, like you'll help, um, you know, there's, if, you know, if there is a service and you there was the service, like that'll help with like, you know, reviewing the the advertisements that that the 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 wording and the copywriting, right. and like you'll you'll have it on more platforms than I have right now, and taking things off my plate that maybe I'll learn or you know I can certainly improve that over time. But it's you're right. helping nurture and support the practice owner side of this equation, but then the other side is what no one else is doing, which is helping nurture and and optimize the the individual, the therapist that's looking for the right fit. Uh, that's the thing that like, other than signing a, I don't know, like when, when physical therapists that are looking for jobs, they, you know, sign up on indeed or LinkedIn or whatever, and they just put in their information, their resume, maybe their, their right. license, their, their, their degree and what setting and what state or whatever, but there's not additional information in there that would right. then tie, tie back to the right fit that then connects to the overarching thing that you mentioned in the right. beginning, which is like job satisfaction and, and that being a huge component of this equation. There's things have changed right. with COVID. There's, there was the stimulus money, there was COVID, there was work from home, there was furloughs, there were layoffs. People moved back home with their parents. People moved out of state. They, the, some people moved out of the city here in New York city, people moving back, people right. moved, left, left San Francisco, as you know, um, there, there's yeah. been a lot of transient behavior and a lot, it's been kind of a shakeup. And who knows how much of that is a, a correction or just a, a normal cycle. But anyway, just, just going back to this, if you're nurturing both sides in a way that's certainly unique from what else is out there right now. Oh, for sure. And, and the other thing, you know, leveraging technology in smart ways. So not just creating an app and throwing it out there and thinking it's going to solve all the problems of the world. I, I, you know, I am in San Francisco, been in Silicon Valley and all for a long time. And, I hear all these things come about and, you know, these guys or folks think that this app is going to fix everything. And, it, and that's almost never the case, right? It's, it's always a hybrid model. You can leverage technology. We're doing that. I've got an LMS system getting set up. That's learning management system where we're doing automated training on both sides of the equation as well, you know, for the candidate to go through the process for the employer so that, you know, Interview number one looks like this. You need to have two people there. You need to have, like, what are the rules? What are the ways you're going to do it? Here's the score sheet and the template that you can adapt and use in your own, you know, your own business, your own practice. Um, you know, giving them training and teaching and a framework on both sides. Again, not to coerce or convince the other side that they're the right one or whatever, but really to be open, honest, and candid and find the right fit because when you're doing it well and genuinely and you're open and honest about what your values and beliefs are and your vision and your purpose and where you're going that you know so dave it, here a quick aside when i'm talking to business owners right at conferences and other stuff on stage one of the things i like to say that always like 
it's like the record screech, right? Over the whole stop talks and everybody looks up and like, what? People don't work for money, okay? And they always kind of freak out and like, look, and it doesn't matter if it's a room of 20 people or 200 people. It's like, how many of you volunteer? And then what? I'm like Little League, School Site Council, Sierra Club, you name it. What do you, Politically, whatever, do you volunteer your time, right? 80, 90% of the folks in the room do. And if I say, and have you ever, all of them have, right? Okay. So what if, you know, then there's the, why, why did you volunteer? Why did you work? Why did you work for free, right? Well, because they believed in the purpose. They believed in the mission of the organization. They believed in the cause, the why, you know, they aligned with the values and what they were teaching the kids or, the, or what they were trying to, the change they were trying to make in the world or whatever, right? What if you could marry that in your business to get also, hey, compensating people well, right? We can pay the bills and they can come to work for a little bit more of a, a reason, a cause, tie that in. I mean, that's one of the things that A players want is meaningful work. They want meaning in their work. They want connection. So if we can build that and incorporate that in as well, that's a huge benefit. I mean, for like what we talked about before, like resetting our culture in the PT practices was a huge relief just on a day-to-day -day basis and, you know, having work be pleasant I and mean, the people you're around be aligned and, you know, working for the, the same thing, being motivated intrinsically because they were working for a, a bigger cause or a greater good or some, some more aligned values in the team and all that stuff. So, and I had somebody ask me this too, man. And I loved it. So I actually added it to the back of the brochures and I'm going to update those and stuff as well. He said at the end, so this is an employee, this is an onboarding. This is a client already paid the bill going through and all of it. And after we're going through the first interview, he's like, I got to ask you, isn't this just a little bit um, idealistic? And I'm like, this was, this was you presenting PT match to a practice owner. Oh, not, not only presented, we, he already signed up. You know, this was the onboarding call. We're at the end of the onboarding call. So I've learned about, you know, their culture, what they, you know, their organizational structure, you know, what the practice model is, who they're staffing, all the rest, what their needs are, all the rest of that stuff, right? So I'm kind of fleshing out this profile. And, they, and he, before we get off the phone, he says, isn't this all just a little bit idealistic? I'm I like, mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. He, but he already signed up and paid. Right, right, so right. He, but, he, he, he knew that ahead of time and still well, joined. Yeah, but, but, but he, thought, thought, he thought that initially. And yeah, so, but see, so this is so this is this is somebody down in the in the southeast and I in Florida. I grew up in Florida and I, I came home, I told my wife, I'm like, I love Southerners, Floridians, and because they will <laughs> say it straight to you, right? Um, and people kind of miss that sometimes, but he's like, Isn't this just a bit idealistic? And and what I said was, I'm like, Well, yeah, yeah, it is. And uh I'm like, but you know, the goal here is to change the world, even our little corner of it. And he kind of was a little bemused, but a little bit like, well, well, we'll see how it goes, right? But it is. And I'm kind, kind of my reaction to that was, dude, if you're doing a startup from scratch and it's not a little bit idealistic, then what are you doing? You know? When you presented it to me on one of our coaching calls and you kind of just read through it and what do you think of the cost and this and that and the offering and here's what you and your team do. I'm like, yeah, like, you know, I don't know how much, I, I don't know the number right now, but it's thousands of dollars that I spent on LinkedIn and indeed ads this year. And I've gotten some good, you know, some good folks in the pipeline and, and really uh, have tried to improve my whole process with it. And so um, it, again, it's all, it's a, it's an investment in, in the practice and the business in terms of like, taking folks through a process that is organized and just trying to find what's the best out there. So for some folks watching or listening, like maybe the best thing for them is like indeed in LinkedIn ads or zip recruiter or whatever it might be. But when you presented it and read kind of read through it, I was just like, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a no brainer in terms of like what you'll do, what, how it would help offload things and, and have someone else take care of it in a, in a, in a nuance, like, in a good way, good nuanced way, like unique approach, uh, as opposed to what now, and sometimes I get frustrated with Indeed ads and it's like non-physical therapists applying to my job. And 
all that type of stuff that just like, I'm like, is this even worth, is this even worth my time and money? I have to go in right. and reject the candidate because otherwise in three days, that's going to charge me 70 or 80 or whatever dollars or something. So I'm glad that there's something that's different, you know, new and, and sounds, you know, innovative, even though it's more like humans involved, it's still like an innovative approach or, or process right now. Well, thanks. But, you know, for anybody hiring a recruiter in any capacity, the, you know, yet yeah, we'll, we'll revamp the job postings and put those out there and all that stuff, right? But I kind of look at that as like it's fishing, you're putting lines in the water and you're kind of hoping for a bite, right? But that's a real passive way to attract talent. So I'm out there hunting every day too. So it's kind of like, you know, the difference between fishing and spear fishing, right? They're um, out contacting candidates, starting conversations, saying, hey, I'd love to learn about your career. Um, I want to know what you want. I mean, ultimately, if you, again, you go back to that matchmaker model, how can I find a match for you if I don't get to know you first, right? If I don't know what's important to you, if I don't know, it's funny too, when we first started this, when I first started this, my wife kind of reminded me like, well, you're not hiring them for you. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I know that, right? I'm not trying to find my match, right? That was the other thing. It's like, I'm trying to get to know like you and your practice, right? And the other clients and stuff, I know much more about their practices now, which is actually really rewarding and interesting. And I like it, right? I just like talking to the business owners, like talking to the practice owners. So I learn more about what they're doing or their challenges, what's going on. You know, what are they, what are they really proud of? What do they do really well? Um, all those things start to come together. Who's your ideal candidate? You know, who's your favorite? Don't give me names, whatever. But who's like your favorite employee or two or three or whatever? Like what are the, what attributes they have? What do they do, right? So, and then the same thing, we're having the same conversations on the other side with the candidates. And that's also really cool because it's different people in totally different stages of careers, right? Some like try to get out of clinical care and do tech stuff. Some that are like want to do their clinical specialty. Some that are coming straight out of school. Um, but it's, yeah, I don't know, it, it, a part of it's just fun, right? And that's, as we scale and grow and hire people, it'll be the same thing. I want to find people who want to talk to people, right? Who are curious, who are interested, who are genuinely interested, who want to know more about them and, you know, go out there and find that match. Because it really is a, a, a lot about, I mean, as we said, the, that's the whole premise. It's about that. And that's kind of the test. If we do that and we find great matches, Will those people be happier at work? Will they be more engaged? Will they be more productive? Will they be, you know, will they stick around longer? Will all those dividends pay off as well? It certainly sounds like it. Well, it, it makes sense, right? So that's, but there's the confusing thing. If it makes so much sense and it's so obvious once it's stated, why aren't other people doing it? Right? So... I mean, what, one answer is it's hard work. Like I, I'm not afraid to show anybody what I'm doing every day because it's it, it's it, it's a lot of blocking and tackling. It's a lot of repetition. It's a lot of rejection. It's a lot of you know wh when it comes through, it's great. But there's you know there's a whole lot of leave me alone, get lost compared to um, you know or I'm super happy in my job right now. You know, check back in two years. <laughs> instead of, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd love for you, love for you to help me, right? So it's really going through a numbers game and hitting, you know, 100 or more people a day, every day, and then having conversations with as many of those as possible. So, yeah, I mean, if you can, in your, I'm just thinking back, like, in my business, even when we were at 40, 50 employees, I didn't have somebody doing that, right? Devoting that kind of time and effort and resource to... Yeah. You guys are just doing like ads. you're just doing like the traditional paid ads, whatever the paid channels were. Then ZipRecruiter, Indeed, LinkedIn, yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. A A ABTA job board, exactly. Association websites. We even held a job fair. I made that pay for itself though, because I invited a whole bunch of other employers. Right. I mean, it, we didn't turn it into a business or anything, but we could we so, paid for the rental of the room and for the catering and all that stuff, and then we got candidates to show up. Um, so that was that was interesting. We try to get really creative. You know, we had a lecture series. We brought in people um, every couple months. We brought in Greg Payne from uh, New Zealand. Um, we brought Chris, Chris Powers up from Southern California. We had some of the surgeons talk sometimes from around here. You know, um, but yeah, we we put on these lectures and series and invited the entire PT community. 
into our place, which I think is still a great recruiting thing and a way to get to know people in the area, but it's, you know, it's labor intensive and it costs money. And, you know, again, if that's what you want your core business to be, great, but it, you know, the more of that you're doing, the less you're attending to your core business. So. Great. Do you want to uh, screen share the website or the brochure or anything like that? And, or just sure. really walk through like a little bit more of, of how you would help owners? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, for anybody who really is interested, PT Match, it's ptmatch.io, IO, because, you know, we're trying to be tech forward and all that stuff. Um, but you can go through here, you can sign up and subscribe, and then um, you can go through and read all about it. But for candidates, they can start a candidate profile here. They can download the brochure, which I have up on the, I'll, I'll, instead of clicking there, I'll get a PDF in a second. Um, but more about what we're doing, you know, how it works. For employers, same kind of thing, schedule a call, we'll um, chat for 15, 20 minutes, answer your questions. Make sure you've looked at the employer brochure too, though, because it, it breaks all that stuff down. It gives you the Gallup study, it talks about the relationship thing, um, which is particularly important if you're bringing on like your hiring team or you've got partners or other folks you need to talk to. Our, our jobs listing, that is just a like a sprinkling sample of what we've actually got listed and the kind of the background and stuff here too. But, um, you know, scheduling a call, getting the employer brochure. This is the employee candidate brochure, um, which lays it all out. You know, this is the motivation. 70% of American employees are disengaged at work. It's not that high in PT, I don't think, but it's, you know, there are people not happy where they are. And that, that really kind of, I don't know, that doesn't make me very happy. Um, so there's more information, you know, in here, but again, trying to keep it really simple and share with people like what it's all about and, um, you know, what does fit mean? How, what it, are we serious about really finding fit versus placing people for a fee? And, you know, all that kind of stuff is answered in there. And then, you know, like this, I did, I took that idealistic question and I put on the back of the back cover. Cause I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. And I've been thinking about that for a while too, right? But yeah, we want to we want to change things. We want to make a bigger impact. So why not own it and say so? Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And again, um, this is not a paid placement. I invited you on here. I wanted to get this from a practice. Well, I appreciate I, it. I, I know I know this can help practice owners, and plus, it's content that's kind of relative into our world and it's not necessarily about exiting or selling but obviously it's about growing your team and potentially becoming more and more like of an absentee owner if that's what you want but again this recruiting and hiring is such a a, a big hot topic and challenge right now for so many practice owners i know i think that's part of why you're doing this and that's why i wanted to get you on here for it it, it is and let's give people something that they can use regardless of whether they ever become a client or whatever or not First, we'll do employer and then we'll do candidate. Okay. So, for the employer, one thing I've seen that and I, I see people are not doing that I would highly, highly, highly recommend is two interviews. Okay. First interview focused on who the person is. In other words, their values, their beliefs, their past experiences, how they handle things, how they deal with the, you know, a manager they didn't get along with or an employee conflict or a patient who didn't like them or all those kinds of things and see if those you know, past experiences, past things line up with what you believe and what you would do and what your priorities are, okay? Then you can get to the skills. That's the second interview. The other thing about this for the employers that I see that I, that I think is missing is the founder very often is the one doing all of, doing all of it, okay? And I would highly recommend you have two people, and this, is, this was in the top grading research and this is Harvard Business and on and on, but anyway, two people in the interviews, okay? Not a panel. I remember going to a, an admissions thing with like nine people and two of us candidates like trying to get into a PT school, right? I think that's a terrible setup. But two interviewers with one candidate is not necessarily, and it helps guard against our own, um, you know, unconscious biases. It helps guard against a moment of distraction or a misinterpretation, 
um, whether that's generational or accents or you know regional or whatever. Um, I know I've walked out being like, well, that was terrible. And then having somebody go, what? I'm like, well, when they said this, like, that's not what that meant. Like, what? No, that's, you know, no, what they meant was this. You're like, oh, really? Like, yeah. Like, oh, oh, I totally would have blown it. Right. If you, so, if you had done that solo. Yeah. 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 I would have totally misinterpreted one of the things they said, whereas somebody on my team who was younger and had a little bit different perspective was like, no, 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 that's, that's, that means this. Right. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. That makes sense. Right. It actually made more sense in the context, but I was like, why would they say that in an interview? Um, right. So, but there are things like that that you can protect against and you're going to, you know, and then you're able to have a conversation with each other about the candidate. The other thing that I would encourage you as an employer, but also the candidates to do when you do that and you start mixing up the interview team, the candidate gets to meet more and more people on the team. Okay. And very often, you know, the owner, the founder will kind of take control or maybe the partners and they will present the company, the organization in one way. And as a candidate, I want to make sure I get opportunities to talk with other people on the team. I want other perspectives. I want to verify and validate is what they're, is what they're telling me actually the case. And the thing is that the more, the more people in an organization that you talk to, even for five or 10 minutes at a time without, you know, the hiring manager or the owner or somebody there, right? The more you're going to get a fuller picture of what what it's really like to be in that place every day. So for the employers, two people present, focus on who they are first, and then get onto the skills assessment and stuff. Because too often we're prioritizing things in the reverse order. We're looking at all their credentials and skills and not really doing a thorough enough assessment on you know who they are. And, and, and by that, I mean really drilling down too, because you and I know this, that as you meet somebody and you like them and you smile at each other and you hit it off, our default position is to think they're like us, they share our values, that they, they're, we have more things in common than we necessarily do. So you've got to really vet that. So that's advice also for the candidate side, just because they're nice and hosting, you offer you a water, you know, the place is clean you got to go deeper. You got to ask more questions. Make sure you're prepped with some questions about, you know, ask them scenario questions. What would you do if a patient called upset about XYZ? You know, or have you ever had a manager in conflict with an employee and said, well, what, what happened with that? But, but come up with scenarios that will answer the questions around how you would like things handled. You know, I remember a job when I was in aid, like way long ago, but we were, I was confused about something and I asked a question. She's like, well, I give out information on a need to know basis. And I was like, well, you just told me to do this job. Like, you know, in my head, I'm like, I kind of need to know. <laughs> I don't know if I could do the job, right? But that would have been something really useful and interesting and, and uh, valuable to know before I would work there. You know, like, are, are we open and candid and transparent? Do you, you know, distribute information on a need to know basis? Or, you know, how is all that handled? So, you know, go in with better questions. Think about what you can find to see if the organization is aligned with your personal values and aspirations and priorities around around patient care, around how you make decisions, around whatever it is that's important to you. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, so that was more on the employer side. And then did we well, cover the, the employee yeah, side or the, the, well, the searcher side? Yeah, that's... I mean, that that kind of flips to the candidate side of making sure you get to meet the employers, you know, other people at the employer site, other people on the team, not just, you know, one point of contact. Make sure that you're going in with those scenario questions as well. Like what happens in that organization when this scenario happens, when a patient is not happy, when a manager you know, has a conflict with an employee or when two employees are not getting along, how does the organization handle that? You know, and you want clear answers that also kind of fit with the way you think it ought to be handled, you know, or maybe they have something really innovative and interesting that makes more sense to you. But that'll be very revealing if you go in. I, and I can't tell you, Dave, how many times over the years I've interviewed people and said, okay, well, what questions do you have for us? And they're like, oh, I don't have any. How in the world are you establishing fit if you don't have any additional questions? But I think it probably goes back to, you said, uh, compensation, 
location or convenience and what was the third thing? Like, right. like we, top we three things. Nice. They seem nice and they, organized. They seem, they seem, they seem nice right. enough and welcoming or warm enough or whatever. So yeah. really, it's just like maybe three average or three typical data points, but not like, is this truly the right fit for me that's going right. to you know be a place where I can grow and maybe not like what Warren Buffett says, like tap dance to work every day, but like, you know, something where you're looking, you're, you're looking forward to, to work and you're looking forward to going in and as opposed to dreading where they're going in. And obviously if you have more assistance or help from a service like this in order to ensure the right fit and you find a place where then you can maybe flip, at least for you individually flipping like those percentages of uh, disengagement on average versus uh, what it could be, which is like uh, fully engaged and you know motivated to participate in that team dynamic and in a growing office or growing culture in a rewarding you know environment. Well, yeah, and one of the tests, like from the candidate side, and you could ask this from the employer side too, but is your staff or are you as the as the employee, do you have as much or more energy when you're leaving work as when you got there? Right. That's a great indicator of are you in a great, in a, in a great situation, right? And if you're if you're leaving at the end of the day, like oh my god, I can't wait to get out of here, you're probably not in a great situation, right? So really start thinking about well, what would a great situation look like? What would be different? What would I want to happen? And and start creating you know put those things down as your questions, because again you're. It just, I would hate for people to like, and I think they're doing this, otherwise the numbers would be shifting, right? They're leaving one bad situation for another or one mediocre situation for another, right? And they're not going through and really thinking about, okay. And I think a lot of times candidates are afraid to ask, like, what would you do when a manager has a conflict with an employee? Like, look, I mean, if I'm an interviewer, I'm like, well, the, the employer, I'm like, what do you mean? Can you be more specific? So give me an idea, but if you give me the scenario, I can tell you exactly what we do. You know, and if that aligns with what you're all about, cool. If it isn't, you know that before you ever jump in. Right. right. So I, I would ask more thorough questions. And right now, better than ever, I mean, PTs are in huge demand. You have lots of choices. Find the right place for you. You know, we also know that burnout is rampant in the profession. Right. People get tired of it and go on to do something else because they're not happy. OK, well, is it really the patients you're not happy with or is it all the other stuff? Right. What if you're in a dynamic culture where your workmates are are great and you guys get along and do stuff together outside and, you you know, you get along with cool people. Cool people is one of those things that one of those seven things that top that a players want. But cool people mean something different to every different group of people. Right. So cool people. I've, I've got people like. Right now, you and I talk about this, like your jobs, what you've got, there's so much freedom and autonomy and, you know, cruising around the city and stuff and seeing different places and, you know, gyms, offices, uh, houses, homes, apartments on all economic levels and everything in between. I mean, that's really cool for the right person, right? I've got uh, other folks that are way more traditional, both in their structure and their management style and everything else. We've got another couple employers that are, they're, I mean, they're really bookish, right? They're super high on research and article sharing and, you know, getting the certifications and teaching and all that kind of stuff. Find your tribe, man. That's what we're here for is not to pass judgment and say, oh, well, you're not, you know, you're kind of nerdy, so you're not going to fit. Like, no, dude, I got your fit. They're right here. They, uh, they love, you know, they love nerding out on the research and all that stuff, right? Somebody else who likes doing, you know, whatever it is they do it, it's but that's that's where we're trying to help people you know puzzle pieces come together to find the right fit and and i think you can correct me if i'm wrong i think when you and i talked about this recently you might have said something that was like a light bulb for me where a, a traditional search like a traditional candidate will look kind of locally at like sure. what's what else what's the best what are my best options nearby and I think you might have mentioned something about like if PT Match gets to where you think it can get to, even in the near future, even this calendar year, it's possible or feasible to, for you to potentially identify candidates that are 
so dialed in the right fit, but it might be someone that lives in another state and maybe they sure. would be the right fit for me. And because you might be able to help show them or assist them that right. this might be the best fit for you in terms of engagement and finding something that's rewarding and that has competitive pay and all the things, right. perks, benefits, whatever that they're looking for, that they, they might even be open to relocating right. similar to like the executive headhunters, which, but again, that is a higher tier in general with like compensation and it's, it's, um, a higher touch and more white glove service because it's, there's like less roles and, and all that. But anyway, um, that was something that I think you mentioned recently. And I don't know if yeah. that's something that you could speak to, cause maybe it's, it's too early with the PT match, but, um, it seems like that would lend itself to that being possible as opposed to, again, the traditional recruiting model where candidates don't, maybe they don't know any better and they're just happy to be in San Francisco or New York city. And they're not looking right. to relocate and they're just looking at local job availability instead of what's truly the right fit for them. And the right fit for that individual unique person might be in a different state. It might, or it might even just be a resort town, you know, in Northeast Pennsylvania instead of in Philly, right. Or whatever. So sometimes the relocation piece of things may not be that big of a stretch. And, um, you know, there might be people kind of candidates, particularly kind of dismissing that out of hand. There are going to be others, though, that are, um, you know, I, I think part of the irony is there are people who are newer in the career might have more flexibility to relocate. People who are who have been around longer might be more in some cases I'm encountering this actually more interested in the possibility if they find the right place because they've been in these kinds of jobs that they haven't loved. They've been good enough. Right. And they're not feeling the fulfillment. They're feeling burnout. They're feeling tired. They're not loving what they do every day. And it's like, oh, well, what if we find the right place? You know, I'm still going to share it with them. They can say no. I mean, that, that's the other thing. I, they, I, I don't control any of these people on either side, you know, any of them. So it's again, it's about finding the right fit, the potential, and then they can get to meet each other and see. And if it is clicking and they are really loving it, the opportunities and stuff, then yeah, we might open some doors that uh, neither side really thought were there. Right. Um, do you want to go through the brochure at all? No, people can read that. I, okay. they, I had a, so I had a lecture. So, so they, get, they can go to ptmatch.io. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm just thinking, Dave, my goodness. I had a lecturer in PT school that read the syllabus. And it was a one day a week, six hour, five hour course or something in neuro. And then I was told I should take the neuro too by the same instructor. I'm like, no way. <laughs> neuro two was optional. I'm like, not a chance. Not a chance. I remember, yeah, it was five hours, 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Monday evening. Read, read the syllabus. No conversation. Okay. No questions. I, I certainly wouldn't want to do that to people. Got it. Uh, I just want to circle back on that Gallup poll really quick. Uh, yeah. you, you had mentioned, it makes sense. Like you, you, when you speak, you said you'll ask the audience, you know, 70, 80% of the people have volunteered. Oh, almost all of them have volunteered at some point. Almost all. But okay. I, 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 if I could push back against that a little bit, no yeah. one is going to volunteer 40 hours a week at Little League no, or, the, or the PTA or whatever. So am I being too negative by saying, there's always going to be some, I think, large percentage. Maybe it's not as large as I'm saying, but I think there's always going to be a large percentage mm -hmm. of people that they they have to go out and 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 do something to make some amount of money to cover their expenses, their living expenses, and all that. And then they unplug from that, and then they just have whatever free time. So they do something meaningful. Yes. Well, yeah, that's the way our society's set up right now. That's the mindset. So that, that's just the way we were kind of taught and solve our parents yeah, do and neighbors. I think so. Yeah, but that, that's why kind of, you know, asking folks, have you ever volunteered? Have you ever done anything? You know, the vast majority have. I mean, I tell people, look, I belong to an organization of entrepreneurs um, here in California where some of them like literally have unicorn companies. Okay, they've got billion dollar companies and they volunteer for the entrepreneurs organization. Okay, why? They could be making a ton more money doing other stuff, and instead they're working for free to promote entrepreneurship and help other people, right? 
my only thing is I, it, I'm saying it doesn't have to be that dichotomy where you have to go volunteer for free. I'm saying there's a reason people do that. So if you could capture some of those reasons in your business, in your organization and provide more connection to the meaning of the work and the fulfillment and what you're actually doing, which is not, you know, that, that those connections aren't often made, right? But if you think about what physical therapists, like, let's start with this audience, what PTs and PTAs are doing every day, you're changing people's lives. When's the last time your boss or somebody said, hey, great job for helping Mrs. Chen stay independent in her home, right? That's amazing what you just did. Or for helping, you know, Billy pitch and he got an offer to the, you know, the school that he wanted to go to for the college, right? The things you're doing every day are changing lives. And we're missing a huge opportunity as founders, employers, leaders, and making that connection for people and really recognizing that. I think there's a, you know, there, there, there's not nearly enough of that. And we kind of expect the patients to do it and they don't do it because that's their expectation that they were going to get that, right? And even if they do it, it's, it's not all of them all the time, right? And we don't tell those stories and we don't give that kind of feedback loop. And then people get burned out and tired of, of you know, the thankless job because of, all the bureaucracy and you know, the onerous billing rules and documentation and all the compliance stuff and the authorizations and the paperwork for the you know insurance and all the other crap that they have to deal with you know and we we meanwhile you're changing lives man but that's if that's so cool why aren't we setting up our organizations to give that feedback and to recognize people for that and the, the cool thing is some are, right? So if you're out there, if you're listening and you're like thinking about the next job, those places do exist, right? And I've had employers do the same thing. Like, oh, well, you know, the people we are looking for, they're, they're, uh, how do we reach them? They're, they're not enough of them out there. Like, dude, they're, th they're like, I think there are 300,000 physical therapists in the US now. That ideal candidate that you want, they, they are out there. They exist, right? We just got to reach them. Any other tips real quick, just to wrap up, uh, any other ways to reach them? So practice owners use, again, the job boards. I mentioned to you on our coach call the other day, like uh, a candidate physical therapist suggested that I do a video uh, day a, a, a day in the life of one of yeah. our mobile concierge physical therapists going from apartment to apartment or uh, office or, you know, from patient to patient as they travel around and as they go around the city. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, so I need to, you know, get on that. Maybe that's some of the, uh, younger millennial age that like would kind of learn or understand our value proposition or our, you know, the possibilities with us via, you know, quick, you know, videos, almost like TikTok, Instagram type, uh, right. you know, short, short form videos. Any other tips just to wrap up for other practice owners on whether platforms, media type, uh, marketing yeah. message, th those types of things. Yeah, yeah, the Pina Colada song, <laughs> right? So we have more channels available to us to reach people than ever before in the history of mankind. Okay, so when we start talking about job boards, this, that, dude, there's so many channels. There's so many ways. Pick one, pick one where they are. But it, what's more important, I think, is what the message is. So the message has to resonate with the person on the other end. And that's why I'm saying the Pina Colada song, because that was a that was a personal ad. They're saying about a personal ad that this guy's girlfriend, lady, whatever, put in the newspaper, right? And he was bored and he's looking through the personals ads. Right. And it just so happened it was her and everything was great, right? But this was somebody looking for a way out of a boring relationship. And then discovered, oh, wait, we've got more in common and we just need to, you know, relight the spark or whatever. That's a weird 70s, you know, <laughs> version. I didn't know. I didn't know there's lyrics, but yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, totally. You know, yeah, you have to you have to actually listen to it. It's but but the but the whole thing is the the ad talks about the other person. So the messaging starts with who you are, not who I am. 
So, you know, when I'm reading, if I'm, if I'm a candidate, I'm scrolling through, how many, I mean, go, go look at the job listings. We are a professional PT practice. You know, the hospital, you must lift 75 pounds. Like, could you get drier reading? If you want to go to sleep, go read the job postings. You know, start writing about the candidate. What's the candidate bring? What do they look like? And, and, and you help me with this also, which is like, what do they want, right? So like coaching, mentorship, yeah. support, they want uh, opportunities and growth. So you kind of put that sure. as a as maybe a headline or a subheadline. Sure. And or of, the first of, paragraph, of the what, are, what are their values and beliefs? You, you truly believe in putting patients first, or maybe you don't. Maybe you believe in, you know, efficiency and effectiveness over convenience or, you know, whatever. But that's something that we also don't do is, you know, I'll, I want to, I tell my clients, share the good, the bad, the ugly. And they're like, well, what? I don't want to tell them that. Well, look, if it, by the way, the bad isn't necessarily bad, right? If everybody here works hard while they're here, say we're looking for hard workers. That's great because what's going to happen to the folks who aren't hard workers? Are they going to apply? Just save yourself a ton of time, right? Let people self-select out for the right reasons, you know, but be a little bit more honest, a little bit more candid, a little more thorough in the description of the individual you're looking for and the, you know, what, what you're like, what your culture is like, what your organization is like. And then the same thing from the candidate side, they got to be able to, I mean, if you're reading through this stuff, I can't tell you how many of these things I looked at and like, I have no idea what the personality of this organization is. It's dry HR compliance stuff, a list, checklist. Yeah, I, I know you have health benefits. So does everybody else, right? I know you have a 401k. Great. <sighs> PTO. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's <laughs> a, dude, what, what's different about you, right? And, and I mean, I, I feel for the candidates in this too, because they're like, how many of these things can you read through, you know? And then they're kind of shotgunning a little bit because none of them sound any different. So then when they start talking to people, maybe they get a little bit of an inkling, but th that takes a lot of their time as well. So yeah, be a little bit more forthright, a little bit more direct, a little bit more front end on your, uh, you know, what's going to make somebody happy, what you're looking for, what they're looking for, what you're about, what they're about. Yeah, that would be the biggest thing I would recommend on that side of things. Awesome. So again, they can check out the website. We'll put in the show notes, the link below, ptmatch.io. Uh, also, any other place for them to connect with you? I know you have sturdycoaching.com I mean, or maybe LinkedIn. it's uh, LinkedIn, yeah, LinkedIn or anywhere else. Yeah, LinkedIn, Facebook. I mean, all the, I'm not hard to find. So ptmatch.io. Oh, that, that, that sounds like, that sounds like Deion Sanders. Yeah. I mean, hard well, to find. I don't, he, <laughs> that's, he a whole, is, that's a whole other episode. He is hard not to. He is hard to not find right now. He's yes. <laughs> everywhere, but uh, but yeah, that is a whole other whole other episode. Awesome, Sturdy, appreciate it. Uh, if you guys find this valuable, insightful, or helpful, subscribe to the Dave Kittle Show on YouTube as well as on iTunes and Spotify. We'll catch you next time here, Sturdy. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com or you can call me at any time, 646-781-8884.